Well, good morning, Liberty Orlando. It is good to be with you, and I'm sorry we are not with you in person, but thank the Lord for technology, and we are literally able to be in two places at the same time. Well, today you're going to hear a wonderful message that's very important for especially some of the things that we are seeing going on around the world uh, today. Uh, my good friend and co-pastor Dan Fisher will be bringing the message today. And one of the scripture texts that he'll be touching on is Exodus chapter 15 verse 3. And of course we know that the Lord himself calls himself a man of war. And there are times like against the Egyptian army, against the uh, Assyrian army, uh, against the uh, walls of Jericho where God has very evidently been at war with an adversary. Well, the message today is very important and along those same lines, and the title is this, Is War Ever the Just Option? Many of you have asked about Pam. I want to give you a brief uh, update on her. She is doing very well. This will probably be her last Sunday to miss. I told her that the way of backsliders is hard, so she needs to get back in church. And so uh, she, she promises next week that she'll give up her backsliding ways and uh, get back in church. Uh, she did have surgery this past uh, Monday. Everything went very, very well. She got the pathology reports late in the week. All the margins were clear, if you know what that means. So that means that they believe they got it all. And she'll be meeting with her oncologist this week, probably a little bit of radiation, we think. Maybe not, but probably. And then she'll be finished and looks like everything's good. So I just wanted you to know, and she wanted uh, me to express to you her appreciation for your prayers, your phone calls, your cards, uh, gifts. Thank you so very, very much. It uh, uh, is confident, she's confident that the Lord was watching over. I read this week about a little girl who was reading about how the angels watch over her. And she said, you know, my angels help me with my math, but he's not very good with science. And so anyway, I just. <laughs> we know that uh, COVID is a brutal disease for those who have whatever wiring that causes them to, to, to battle so much with it. At the same time, we know that it's a 99.8% recovery rate. And I, I think most of us realize that it's not COVID itself that is so much giving us the trouble. It's, it's the opportunity that the leftists have taken to use it to, uh, to put us under their thumb, their, their, their jackboot heel, so to speak. And I wanted to play for you very quickly. I don't know if you've seen this video of AOC in, in Washington, D.C. with a group that she is hosting. I haven't had a check, chance to check the audio. I don't know how the audio will be, but the real, really the audio is unimportant. Watch this and watch the hypocrisy. They know uh, what's really going on. There she is with her group. Notice, no one's wearing a mask. Now they're getting ready for the photo op. Now notice what she does. She puts on her mask, and in, into the picture is going to come another official. He's going to walk in here in just a moment. He's going to be the only other one. There he comes. Now notice, there's just a few of them wearing masks, those two specifically. There she is getting close-ups of her. Now watch what happens immediately after the photo op is over. They're all clapping. They're getting their pictures made. Now notice, the picture is over. Notice he's already lifted his mask. And then notice just a minute or two later, after they're finished, one minute later, and here's AOC again. Okay, now what that illustrates to you is that the very ones who are using mask shaming are the very ones who know the real story that masks basically do not protect us. And to give you uh, evidence of that, as of Wednesday, this past Wednesday, Oregon and Hawaii set all-time um, highs in COVID cases, and they are two of the most masked states in the union. And they set all-time highs. So just a reminder 
that this is really a philosophical battle going on. COVID itself is obviously brutal for those who really get sick, and I'm not downplaying that at all, but this is something more than that. And that little video of AOC and her, her group uh, show you that very thing. All right, today I want to uh, preach a message that's in, in a way a sequel to a message that I preached a number of months ago in talking about uh, the biblical position on violence, self-defense. I want to take it to the next level, and I want to ask the question and then try to answer it biblically. Is war ever the just option? All of us have been watching this week what's going on in Afghanistan, and I am certainly not here to say that what we ought to do is declare war and go back over there. In fact, we probably should have taken those troops and Americans out of there long ago once we had accomplished the objective which is a major mistake on our part. But the way we've unplugged is just unconscionable. As Paul was saying a while ago, this is not the way to do it. And it shows the ineptness of the Biden administration, but not just the Biden administration, but this, this, this military uh, industrial complex that exists, kind of the shadow government regardless of who uh, is in charge as far as elected office. And we've all seen the terrible pictures of, of parents actually willing to give up their little children uh, for some promise of a future while they themselves know that if they don't get out of there, um, they know what they're going to face. And I think what this is, is it's a reminder to us that there is real evil in this world. And that is something that our culture rejects now. Everybody's good. Uh, it's just a matter of your perspective. And we, we've now come to the place culturally where we reject these contrasting positions of good and evil. We, we just don't believe that. Now, we believe that, but the culture, at least many in the culture, no longer believe that, and it is certainly not taught. Now, this is also true in the church. This whole concept has bled over into the church. I want to give you two examples of a couple of pastors who pretty much vocalize what is today considered to be the acceptable view. Uh, this is Greg Boyd, as you can see, the pastor of Woodland Hills Church in St. Paul, Minnesota. I want you to listen to what he says. Neither Jesus nor any other New Testament author ever qualified their prohibitions on the use of violence. The just war theory is something that Christ never taught or even hinted at. We are to love our enemies, turn the other cheek, bless those who persecute us, pray for people who mistreat us, and return evil with good. On what grounds can someone insert into this clear, unqualified teaching the massive exception clause unless violence is justified? He goes on to say the reality is that the criteria one uses to determine what is and is not just is largely a function of where one is born and how one is raised. I wonder if he would have said that had he been living in World War II Germany and he happened to be a Jew. Would, would that have changed his perspective at all? Or if he lived in Afghanistan today and has become a Christian over the last few years. He goes, says, of course, it seems obvious to most Americans that killing to defend and promote freedom is justified, but fundamental aspects of one's culture always seem obviously right to people embedded in the culture. It helps to be mindful of the fact that the person you may end up killing in war probably believes as strongly as you that they are also fighting for a just cause. So here he's uh, equivocating, I guess, uh, radical jihadists to uh, the allied forces that helped to liberate France and ultimately Germany. He closes by saying to refuse to kill for patriotic reasons is to show we actually take our identity in Christ more seriously than our identity with the empire, the nation state, or the ethnic terror cell whence we come. Notice how he conflates an ethnic terror cell with a nation state. Notice he sees no difference. Um, I honestly see no way to condone a Christian's decision to kill on behalf of any country. Now, I'm not saying that I agree with this gentleman. In fact, I completely disagree, but I want you to hear it. And then here's another example. This is Craig Watts. He's the pastor of Royal Palm Church in Coral Springs, Florida. And he says, there are those both in the military and outside of it who seem determined to associate the work of the armed forces or services with the way of faith. Those who find this misguided militaristic Christianity commendable don't hesitate to speak of the war dead as though they are martyrs who were killed in Christian service. Now, I don't know anyone. 
I don't know anyone who believes that every soldier, even American soldier, that dies in war was automatically a Christian. I, I, I don't know anyone who says that. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a broad brush. But then he goes on to say, not wanting to admit to idolatry devotion, many in churches, ministers included, have merged their American nationalism with Christianity. This has resulted in a militarized Christianity in which wars are seen as battles of good against evil and the violent sacrifice of both killing and dying in conflict can be viewed as expressions of faithfulness. But this sort of Christianity is a parody of the real thing, he says. In a war, a soldier is taught to do what everybody is taught throughout their life that they must never do, deliberately maim or kill other persons. To be fit for warfare, soldiers must abandon that crucial lesson for other more deadly lessons. They must be trained to be killers who are capable of killing on demand. No sacrifice is more dramatic than the sacrifice asked of those sent to war, that is, the sacrifice of their unwillingness to kill. Those who follow Jesus can't be taught to kill on command and don't believe what is true is what is worth killing for. Rather, what is true is what is worth defenselessly dying for. So I guess to, to carry his thinking out to the nth degree, if someone was breaking down the front door of his house to do harm for his family, he would sit there and do nothing while they might brutally maim or murder his family or friends. Now, as ridiculous as these positions sound, they are becoming more and more the accepted popular view in most churches today, including churches that we wouldn't think would take this position, Baptist churches and such, uh, churches that we've normally considered orthodox. Now, there's no question that Jesus clearly taught that we are to be peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, he said, for they shall be called the sons of God. Paul says in Romans chapter 14, therefore let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Uh, no question about that. But then he also says in Romans 12, 18, as, uh, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Paul was reasonable enough to understand that sometimes that's not always a possibility. For instance, if you were a Christian Lutheran preacher living in Germany in 1940, it might not be possible for you to peacefully coexist with Nazis who are wiping out not only Jews, but any kind of political, philosophical enemy. Men like uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer that we'll mention at the end of the message. So understand that the Bible clearly teaches that we are to desire peace. At the same time, we all know that there are examples throughout history and certainly in scripture where that was not always an option. Consider, for instance, Abraham long before he was the old Abraham that we think of, who uh, gathered together 318 of his choice uh, warriors, basically, in his clan and went off to war to rescue his nephew Lot, who had compromised himself and ultimately had gotten himself into all kinds of trouble. And to know that God approved of what Abraham did, the, the priest Melchizedek, who is somewhat of a mysterious person in scripture, if you remember, actually met Abraham after the battle and in the name of God blessed him because uh, of his stand that he had taken against injustice and evil and actually said, the Lord has given you the victory, Abraham. Now, what do these preachers that I just quoted uh, do with these passages? Or what about Joshua, who is fighting, for instance, the um, Amalekites or the Amalekites, when Moses and her and Aaron are up on the hill, as Paul, I think, mentioned last Sunday, holding his hands up, and as long as his hands are in the air, God gives them uh, the victory. And even uh, Moses says in Exodus 15, 3, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. What do we do with passages like that? Or what about the story that we heard when we were little children? How the Philistines came against God's people and ultimately a young shepherd boy by the name of David stands up and says, uh, you come to me with your sword and your spear but I come in the name of the Lord of hosts. That Lord of hosts means the Lord of armies, the God of the armies of Israel. This day the Lord will deliver you 
into my hand. And of course, uh, David proceeds to knock him down with a rock and then uh, cut his head off. Um, what about King David that God honored in, in numerous many ways who said in Psalm 144 verses 1 and 2, Blessed be the Lord my rock who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. My loving kindness and my fortress, my high tower, my deliverer, my shield, and the one in whom I take refuge, who subdues my people under me. How do we deal with these passages of Scripture? Or what about in the book of Judges, chapters 6, 7, and 8? The familiar story of Gideon. The great warrior who, of course, leads a much diminished force and I guess figured God intended on a suicidal mission. But anyway, we know the victory that God gave him once again, uh, war, battle in the name of what is right. What about Nehemiah? When they're rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, you remember the story that some of the men work while other men do what? Hold the weapons in this photograph here or this painting. You can see among the workers, these men scattered out around holding the weapons of war. Now, some would say, well, you know, that's just the Old Testament. Dan, we're not Old Testament Christians. We're New Testament Christians. Men like Andy Stanley, the son of Charles Stanley, the pastor of the famed First Baptist Church of Atlanta, Georgia. Andy now pastors a church called North Point, and uh, that church is gargantuan. Andy, as you know, uh, released a book about two years ago entitled Irresistible, where he makes the claim that we ought to just completely ignore the Old Testament. In fact, uh, listen to what he says about the Old Testament. I've given some of these quotes before. He says, Jesus' new covenant does not need propping up by the Jewish scriptures. Now, whoa, whoa, wait. What are the Jewish scriptures? Because in my recollection, the New Testament were also written by Jews. He goes on to say, the Bible did not create Christianity. Well, whoever said that it did, but the Bible gives us the record of God creating his people on the earth. The resurrection of Jesus created and launched Christianity. So notice how he is separating Old Testament believers from New Testament believers. Your whole house of Old Testament cards can come tumbling down. The good news is even if none of those Old Testament things actually happened, what do you mean if they didn't happen? Uh, I would believe they did happen. Uh, it does nothing to undermine the credibility of our new covenant faith other than it takes out all of the historic proof that leads us up to the New Testament. So it's kind of like building your house with no foundation and no floor. You just throw some walls up and put a roof on it and say, we're going to live here for the next 30 years. Now, how do you think that's going to work out? Well, it's not going to work out at all. So it's interesting that in the New Testament, in Hebrews chapter 11, listen to these verses, 30 and 32, 33 and 34. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. For the time would fail me, Hebrews writer says, to tell of Gideon, of uh, Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel. By the way, all of these warriors who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. So if you're looking for ancient aliens, there they are, right there in Scripture. Now here's the amazing thing. The New Testament is validating the Old Testament. Now that's not the subject of today's message, but Jesus said, you search the Old Testament, you'll find me, because Moses and others were writing about me. But see, our modern culture is very ignorant of most of the facts of history, ignorant of, of theology, and so they just latch on to whoever their most favorite and charismatic speaker is. So all of those who are attending North Point where Andy Stanley's the pastor, unless they're free thinkers and actually study the scriptures, probably buy into this nonsense. So if Andy's going to disconnect from the Old Testament, I guess he's got to disconnect from the book of Hebrews as well because the book of Hebrews connects the New Testament family of faith to the Old Testament family of faith. You see the fallacy? You see what's happening in the church today? Now let me give you some examples out of history. Let me start with this gentleman right here. This is Oliver Otis Howard. Many of you may have never heard of him. He was a uh, 
A Union general during the war between the states, he played a prominent role at the Battle of Gettysburg. He was a born-again believer, so much so that the soldiers who knew him and, and served under him called him the Christian general. In fact, some said that he operated more like an itinerant preacher than he did a Union general. And then if you shift to the Confederacy, you have this man, Thomas Jackson, that most of us know as Stonewall Jackson, a devout Christian, you say, well, how in the world could devout Christians be on both sides of that conflict? Well, because we're fallen individuals and we don't see things clearly. And sometimes we take wrong positions. Supporting slavery was a wrong position. But I think that Jackson also believed that the Southern states were sovereign. And so he was torn. The interesting thing is about these two wonderful generals is that they both lived out their faith. In fact, Jackson was asked one day by a soldier, how is it that you can be so calm and collected when death and destruction is all around you and you ride around on your horse as if you're invincible? He said, oh, look. He said, I believe that God has fixed the time of my death and that does not worry me. I'm just as safe on the battlefield as I am in my bed. And if all men believe that, they would be equally brave. Yeah, so these two soldiers actually face off at the Battle of Chancellorsville. In fact, it is the Christian general, Stonewall Jackson, who routes the troops of the Christian general, Oliver Otis Howard, in that surprise attack, if you know anything about the Battle of Chancellorsville. So you have these Christian generals in our history. Or how about this gentleman that I mentioned a while ago, the Lutheran preacher, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who did not have to go back to Germany once the Nazis started to wipe everybody out was here in America. His friends encouraged him not to go back, and he said, if I don't go back, then when this is over, who will be there to put Germany back together? And so he goes, and he is so committed that, that, that Hitler and the Nazis are evil, he actually participates in the attempts to assassinate Hitler, and it is thus eventually arrested, and as you know, is, is hanged by the Nazis a couple of weeks before the Allied forces liberate uh, the prison where he is held. What about Christians like this? Or what about modern examples? This is General Jerry Boykin. He has spoken here on a number of occasions. I consider him to be a good friend, Paul as well. Uh, he is the VP of Family Research Council headquartered in Washington, D.C. Jerry Boykin is a committed believer and yet was a three-star general when he retired and was the actual commander during the time when the Black Hawk Down uh, event uh, happened in Mogadishu. If you've seen the movie Black Hawk Down, uh, Boykin is not depicted in the movie itself, but he was the ultimate commander when that all came down. You got a Christian who is a military leader. So how do we, how do we rectify all this? Because we're living in a culture that can't seem to connect the dots. Well, what does the Bible have to say? Well, it doesn't directly address this, but it does indirectly. For instance, John the Baptist was approached by a number of people saying, we want to come to God. What do we do? And if you'll notice in Luke 3, verses 14 and 15, it says, likewise, soldiers ask him, saying, and what shall we do? Now, John the Baptist did not say, take off your armor, throw down your weapons, go AWOL, and then you might be saved. Notice what he says. So he said to them, do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely and be content with your wages. What a prime opportunity for John the Baptist to say, you are sinning by being a soldier. But he didn't. What about Jesus to the centurion who sent word that he needed someone healed in his house and listen to what it says when Jesus heard it he marveled and said to those who followed assuredly I say to you I have not found such great faith not even in Israel well this was a prime opportunity for Jesus to say well I'm not going to minister on behalf of that wicked soldier instead he says this man has great faith what about, even though there had been other Gentiles saved periodically throughout the early years of what we call the New Testament era, the first recorded massive Gentile conversion was led by a Roman centurion named Cornelius. You read about it in Acts chapter 10, verse 22, and they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. Notice nothing about stop being a centurion. Now, of course, these pastors I quoted earlier say, well, eventually they probably did, 
Well, how do we know? We're going to argue from the silence of Scripture? The Bible gives us prime opportunities for John the Baptist, for Jesus, for uh, Luke in the book of Acts to condemn soldiering. Instead, nothing of the sort. In Luke 22, verse 36, Jesus said to the disciples toward the end of his ministry, but now he who has a money bag, let him take it and likewise a knapsack, and he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Now, the Bible does not go into great detail about what Jesus meant. I've mentioned this verse many other times, but obviously Jesus believed that these men would need to be able to protect themselves into the future because of the hostile world that he was sending them into. Remember, he said, I send you like sheep into a pack of wolves. Exactly right. And then here's this verse, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. I realize that directly it's speaking of providing a living and a decent shelter and food and clothing. But listen to what Paul says. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Now, it doesn't say this, but don't you think it's reasonable to assume that one of the things Paul would have implied in that is that men, you need to physically protect your family. If you have a responsibility to physically feed and clothe and house your family, I think it just goes without being said that you also have a responsibility to physically protect your family. And notice what, what Paul says here. If a man does not do that, it's as if he has denied the faith and become worse than an infidel. So all of a sudden, these what appear to be really great arguments uh, for passivity and for Christians to just stand back and let evil happen in their midst and just say, well, I'm praying start to lose their strength all of a sudden because we find in Scripture the exact opposite. Now, am I saying then that we ought to be warmongers and that we ought to go over there and just start launching missiles in Afghanistan? No, I'm not saying that at all, and I'm not saying that any of us should long for that kind of thing. But once it's foisted upon us, what will we do? Just stand by and not protect our family and our friends? Will we not protect that which is right, protect liberty, and stand by while evil runs unchecked? Notice what's happening in Afghanistan is a perfect picture of what happens when you allow evil to go uncontested. Think about what Afghanistan is going to be like once we're able to evacuate as many of those poor folks who are stranded there as we can and we're completely gone. What do you think Afghanistan is going to be like then when the Taliban is the law and they initiate Sharia? And by the way, remember their terms. When they talk about women's rights, they mean according to Sharia. They don't mean the way we think. But you see, we have idiots in America who are so, so uninformed and so ignorant of history that they have no idea that these Taliban soldiers and commanders are lying to us. In fact, even Great Britain recognizes it. Today, there is an article where leaders in Great Britain said, when Joe Biden's, Biden said America is back, he should have said America has backed off is what he should have said. So let's go to our own history. Let's go to the 18th century, a period of time that Paul and I talk a lot about because it was when the very principles that have given us the kind of liberty and protection that everyone should want were actually birthed. This is a picture of uh, the preacher Ezra Stiles. He was the president of Yale. And I want you to listen to what he says in 1783 on May the 8th in a sermon where he celebrates the fact that George Washington was initially made the commander of the Continental Forces. I want you to listen. This is a sermon, by the way. Now listen to what he says. These are just little excerpts. The memorable Battle of Bunker Hill convinced us, he says, that Americans both would and could fight with great effect. Now remember, Bunker Hill was in 1775 in June. So this is before Washington was the supreme commander of the Continental Army. In fact, before there even was a Continental Army. 
He goes on to say, whereupon Congress put at the head of this spirited army the only man, George Washington, on whom the eyes of all Israel, he says, were placed. Now, he's referring to themselves as modern Israel. I would take issue with that, but that's what he believed at that time. It goes on to say, this American Joshua was raised up, speaking of George Washington, by God and divinely formed by a peculiar influence of the sovereign of the universe for the great work of leading the armies to liberty and independence. And while we render our supreme honors to the Most High, the God of armies, let us recollect with affectionate honor the bold and brave sons of freedom who willingly offered themselves and bled in the defense of their country, the officers and soldiers of the patriot army and gallant commanders and brave seamen of the American Navy have heroically fought the war by sea and by land. Never was the profession of arms used with more glory in a better cause since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun. Can you imagine preachers preaching like that today? Or listen to Jonathan Mayhew, one of the great preachers out of the first great awakening in 1750. He says, tyranny brings ignorance and brutality along with it. It degrades men from their just rank into the class of brutes. It damps their spirits. It suppresses arts. Remember the Taliban going around and uh, ISIS also destroying all the uh, historic works of art and all in Iraq. And it, okay, um, Nothing has changed. It extinguishes every spark of noble ardor and generosity in the breasts of those who are enslaved by it. It makes naturally strong and great minds feeble and little. Isn't that a perfect description of our president today? See, tyranny has so intimidated him because he's not a man of courage and boldness and conviction. He's living out what Mayhew's saying here, that tyranny makes strong and great minds feeble and little and triumphs over the ruins of virtue and humanity. What he's saying here is that if the righteous do not stand up, they have no reason to complain when the tyrants roll over them and destroy virtue and humanity. Is that what we want? Do we want the crowd that occupied Portland, Oregon? Or the crowd that uh, goes around knocking down statues, even knocking down statues of, of men that support what they believe. They're just too stupid to know that they're knocking down the wrong statues. We want those people to go unchecked. Mayhew finishes then by saying, this is true of tyranny in every shape. There can be nothing great and good where its influence reaches. For which reason it becomes every friend to truth and humankind, every lover of God and the Christian religion to bear a part in opposing this hateful monster. See, this is why the generation that birthed the original America were so bold, were so courageous, because they were hearing preachers say things like this instead of those two morons that I quoted at the begin, beginning of this sermon. Now, understand that these men did not want to fight. They didn't want a conflict. Listen to Samuel Cooper, who was the pastor of the Brattle Street Church in Boston. By the way, his church was one of the number of churches called the Church of the Patriots. Men like John Adams and Ben Franklin attended his church. He was pen pals with Benjamin Franklin. I actually believe we've been sold a bill of goods on Benjamin Franklin. I don't think the caricature that we believe today is the man who was actually Benjamin Franklin. But regardless of that, in, on October 25th, 1780, here's what he said. He said, peace, peace, we ardently wish, but not upon terms dishonorable to ourselves or dangerous to our liberties. And our enemies seem not yet prepared to allow it upon any other at present, the voice of providence, the call of our still invaded country, and the cry of everything dear to us all unite to rouse us to prosecute the war with redoubled vigor. Now notice this is a preacher talking about prosecuting the war. Upon the success of which all our free constitutions and all our hopes depend. And what I'm trying to illustrate to you is that America has not always been a weak need, ignorant bunch of people. There was a time when we understood the principle that evil is real and must be resisted or it will overwhelm all of these pacifists that stand by praying while evil rapes and pillages the countryside. They believed 
they meaning the preachers of the 18th century, that they had no choice but to stand against tyranny. A popular uh, British uh, philosopher in that day, Edmund Burke, said this, and you know it, you could quote it, all it takes for evil to triumph is for good men to do what? Sit by and let it happen. And that is exactly what is happening today, not just in Afghanistan, but in the American culture because we're led by preachers who have misinterpreted Scripture, who've unhitched from the Old Testament, so to speak, and are preaching a, really a different gospel than the one that is laid down for us from Genesis to Revelation. You see, they've just gone through and picked the parts that they think people want to hear. So here's George Duffield preaching on December the 11th, 1784. This is a year after the war is over. He said, looking back, hard alternative to resign liberty or wage this hazardous war. And yet none other remained. But liberty was the prize. She chose freedom or death as her motto and nobly resolved on war with all its horrors that at least her last her meaning America, her last expiring groan might breathe forth freedom. These are the messages we need to be hearing today. Now here's a mural in Connecticut that depicts a preacher by the name of Moses Mather who was preaching a very uh, powerful message to the people of Connecticut. And here's a portion of that sermon in 1775. Since then, we are compelled, he says, to take up the sword in the necessary defense of our country, our liberties and properties, ourselves and posterity. Let us gird on the harness. Now, what he's talking about there, harness, is the strap and the holder for a sword. Let us gird on the harness, having our bosoms mailed, that means with protection, and firm defiance of every danger. Notice what he says about danger. You don't run from it like a chicken. You stand up and defy it like a man. And with fixed determined purpose to part with our liberty only with our lives. Engage in the conflict and nobly play the man. And I think that's a key phrase, gentlemen. Play the man. What we need in the American church is men and not wusses like Andy Stanley. We need men who know the truth and are not afraid to say it. Amen. And he goes on to say, play the man for our country, the cities and churches, and demonstrate to the world that the free, irre irrepressible spirit that inspired the breasts and animated the conduct of our brave forefathers is not degenerated in us, their offspring. I wonder what that generation would think of us if they saw our generation. Well, that's what Moses Mather was concerned about in 1775. He was afraid that his forefathers, separatists that we call pilgrims, people like that, would be embarrassed at the lack of commitment that some had in his day. They believe that God calls upon all believers to stand against tyranny. Henry Cummings, this is the best portrait I can find of him, was a preacher not only in New Hampshire but also in Massachusetts. He delivered a sermon on April the 19th, 1781. I want you to listen to this little portion of it. When God purposes to restrain the wrath of his people's enemies, notice how he's talking here, his people's enemies. Can you imagine Andy Stanley or Craig Groeschel saying something like that today? He usually rouses a spirit of opposition, stirs them up to make a resolute resistance, and animates and excites them to the most vigorous efforts for the maintenance of their rights. Another Massachusetts preacher by the name of Daniel Shute preached this in 1767. Now you can do the math. That's long before the Declaration of Independence. He said, defensive war is then right according to the Constitution of God which is a far more important constitution than the U.S. Constitution, and supported by the written declarations of his will, and in particular is consistent with the rulers of the God, excuse the, the rules of the gospel, including the principles of natural religion, which allow and require the defense of our being with all the privileges of being in every capacity, private or public. Now, why is it that I'm throwing all of this out? Because I want to counter this nonsense that we're hearing today that Christians ought to just sit down, shut up, fold their hands, and pray, and let these wicked people just run over the world. 
This has never been the position of God's people. All the way back to the book of Genesis with Abraham. And yet today, this is a prevalent and popular view in the American church. No wonder why we're such cowards. Because there are men with yellow stripes down their back standing in most pulpits today. And I have said, at least for Southern Baptists, of which their churches I pastored most of my life, all those Southern Baptist churches painted white and red, they ought to take buckets of paint and paint them all yellow. Because that's what they are. Moses Mather, back to that sermon. Listen to this quote. Man hath the clearest right by the most indefensible title to personal security, liberty, and private property. All those, by the way, are established in Scripture. And whatever is a man's own, he hath most clearly a right to enjoy and defend, to repel force by force, to recover what is injuriously pillaged or plundered from him, and to make reasonable reprisals for the unjust vexation. And upon this principle, an offensive war may, be, may sometimes be justifiable vis-a-vis -vis when it is necessary for preservation and defense. They believe that not standing was spiritual dereliction of duty. Listen to John Hurt preaching to the troops of New Jersey in 1777, one year after the signing of the declaration. He says, God has assigned each of us our station. Remember Nehemiah and the men on the wall? Each one had a station. And a part which we are obliged to discharge in carrying on the great work of social happiness. Notice that these Christians believed that the influence of salt and light would create a happy, useful society. Imagine that. If then I neglect the part appointed me, I am highly unjust because I take a share of the benefits of society and yet leave the burden to be borne by others. In other words, I'm a freeloader. A greater injustice than this can scarcely be conceived. He who withholds from the public the service and affection to which it is entitled is a criminal of a far higher degree as he thereby robs a whole body of people and deprives the community of her just demand. If, in short, any be wanting in directing his talents to their proper ends, he deserves to be treated as a common spoiler. Just a few more and we're done. Samuel Sherman from Connecticut, August the 31st, 1774. Listen to what he says. There are some who pretend that it is against their consciences to take up arms in defense of their country. But can any rational being suppose that the deity can require us to contradict the law of nature which he has written in our hearts? A part of which I am sure is the principle of self-defense which strongly prompts us all to oppose any power that would take away our lives or the lives of our friends. Some believe that they please God while they sit still and quietly behold their friends and brethren killed by their unmerciful enemies without endeavoring to defend or rescue them. Nor can I wholly excuse from blame those timid persons, that's coward, who through their own cowardice have been induced to favor our enemies and have refused to act in defense of their country to indulge cowardice in such a cause argues a want of faith in God. Now he gets right to the core of it. He says, basically, if cowardice is your reputation, you're probably not a Christian. I think he's right. I think he's right. What did Hebrews 11 say? These were the great men and women who are in the great hall of faith. These men and women who quenched the fire, who fought and were valiant in battle, who put to flight their enemies. These are the ones deserving of being in the hall of faith, the hall of faith of fame. They're the ones, not these wimps and weasels. One last quote. This comes from a preacher named Zabdiel Adams from Massachusetts, 1782. War has one year left to go. This is in an election sermon. He says, It is better to be free among the dead than slaves among the living. 
the ghosts of our friends slain in war, the spirits of our illustrious ancestors. So there he is concerned about what their ancestors would think. Long since gone to rest, who transmitted our fair inheritance to us, meaning they were faithful to hand us a better way, a regard to children still unborn. Now he's talking about us. All call upon us to make greater exertions and will rise up in judgment against us if through cowardice we desert the noble cause in which for many years past we have been engaged. Now when he preached that sermon, he had no idea of knowing that one more year and it would all be over and America would win. But notice what he says here. Even now we must put forth greater exertion. So what is the position of the Christian to be when it comes to violence and to defending sometimes that which is right in war? Well, we should never go out looking for it. We should never be troublemakers on purpose just for the fun of it. We should never ever desire to either fight and or take someone else's life. That's horrible. But yet in Scripture, the Bible clearly teaches that it is God's will for the righteous to stand against the wicked. Amen. Now, it's not our job to judge them. God will take care of that. But friends, if our ancestors had done what the American church is doing today, where do you think we would be now? Yeah, we'd be speaking either English or German or Japanese. Now, I'm saying English. I mean the king's English. But our ancestors were faithful. Now, is America perfect? Of course not. Has America actually uh, pursued and executed unrighteous wars? Yes, I believe we have. Have we done things that are despicable? Of course, because we're fallen just like everybody else. But friend, can you imagine a place that you would rather live than the United States of America? No, why is it that we're the ones having to protect our borders from people coming in and everybody else is building walls to keep their citizens inside their country? There's a reason. There's a reason why those Afghanis are throwing those little infants up to those American soldiers. Hoping they'll catch them. There's a reason why some of those uh, cargo planes, when they landed, had to literally, I know this is gross, but had to scrape body parts off of the hydraulics. Because some of those Afghanis were able to breach the fences and all the, the Taliban and ran out and grabbed hold of those planes. Some of those body parts were frozen. They had to clean those planes before they could take back off to go back to Kabul. Why is that? Because people know instinctively in their hearts there's got to be a better way. And there is. Now I've told this man's story before so it's redundant, but I want to I close with two stories, and then we'll bow and pray. It's the best portrait I can find of him. I wish I could find a better one. That one's incredibly grainy. But this is Samuel Phillips Payson. Many of you will remember because I've mentioned him before. He was a pastor in Chelsea, Massachusetts, which is now swallowed up by Boston. He was a pacifist. He was against the war for independence. I want you to listen to what Joel Headley, who was a historian of his day, wrote in this little short piece about Samuel Phillips Payson. The brutal outrage at Lexington transformed this peaceful scholar and meek divine into the fiery, intrepid soldier. And seizing a musket, he put himself at the head of a party and led them forward to the attack. The gentle voice that had so long spoken only words of peace suddenly rung like that of a prophet of old. A body of British soldiers were advancing along the road. That's the road from Concord back to Boston. Today, a piece of it has been preserved. It's called Battle Road. He poured into them such a destructive volley that the whole were slain or taken prisoners. Now, this is a pacifist pastor. He was a man of peace and conciliation, but the first citizen's blood that crimsoned the green grass would be in Lexington made a clean sweep of all his arguments and objections, and he entered, into, entered with his whole soul into the struggle. There's a preacher in 1775. I did the black robe presentation again yesterday. 
a crossroads, and I, and I ended like I always do with the story of a preacher named John Rossbrug. John Rossbrug was a pastor out of New Jersey that was killed by the Hessians at the Second Battle of Trenton while he was trying to surrender. Many of you have seen the presentation multiple times, so you kind of know his story. The only way we know how his life ended is because one of the Hessians who murdered him went into, New, New Jer into Trenton, New Jersey, boasting, waving around his pocket watch and a few other personal items, bragging that they had just killed a rebel preacher. So that's how we know his story. So they made the man sit down and recount what had happened. And when they said, my gosh, man, do you know that you have killed a man of God? The Hessians' wits came to him, and they said he ran out of that building screaming like a madman. Joel Headley wrote about John Rusbrug's death. He says, let the scrupulous Christian of today condemn, if he can, this noble divine for fighting in defense of his country. He had no doubts of the righteousness of his conduct when passing with prayer on his lips, and that's actually what he was doing. He was praying when they killed him into the presence of his God. Amiable, kind, and distinguished as a peacemaker, he had to overcome all his natural tendencies to war, to take up arms. But having settled it to be his duty, he had no after misgivings. And he died a brutal death. So, is, uh, is war ever the just option? Yes. Yes, it is. Do any of us want it? No. Am I suggesting that we go to war with Afghanistan? No. We should have left there long ago. But the stupidity in the American church today of playing this super pious role yeah. Yeah. that we're too holy to stand up for what is right is leading us down this slope that you see us going down now that's ultimately going to break us to pieces, friends. I predict that. So you and I, I don't know what we can do, but we need to know the truth. And then we need to live according to it. So I'm going to ask you if you would just to bow your heads. I know this is a strange sermon, so it's going to end kind of strange. If our instrumentalists can come. I just want you to contemplate what you've heard today. Now let me say to you that if you don't know Jesus, he fought the ultimate war for you. He fought all of hell. And like John Rossbrug, only he was the son of God, he died for that cause, for you. You need Jesus. Today, if you don't know that you know Jesus, you need to come give your life to him. Maybe today you're a Christian, but you're fumbling around and you don't have a church home and you're not active. Well, then get active. We're in a war here. Thankfully, there's no bullets and bombs yet. But we need to hear the truth and we need to stand for it. There's evil in this world. We don't like that, but it's true. Now, I don't know what we do, but I know we do what we know we can do. And what we can do is do what's right and then spread it around. So today we're just going to pray. If you need to come and pray for any reason, we have counselors here and they'll be happy to share with you. Father, in Jesus' name, we come to you now. Lord, we are not worthy. We have nothing to offer you. We come just as we are. Lord, I know that this is kind of a strange sermon. Well, we preached in very many churches today. But Father, I pray that somehow I've communicated these principles in a way that is honoring to you. None of us want violence. None of us want to see wars and bloodshed. War is a terrible thing. But Lord, allowing the evil in this world to go unchecked is even more terrible. Lord, help us to get our minds right, our hearts right. I don't know what's ahead of us. But Lord, if we keep going down the road that we're on, I believe some terrible days could be in front of us. But for believers, it's just all part of who we are and what you've called us to be. All these quotes I gave of these Christians in the 18th century, they were caught up in a mess. But you used them to do mighty things, and today we celebrate it. They did the best they could. But they stood on truth. And that's something that the American church pretty much is not doing. Help us to be men and women of the book and Father, as we linger here for just a moment, if we need to come for any reason, we pray we will and do it and settle our lives with you. 
Thank you for loving us. Thank you for all you are. Help our wayward country to get its mind and its heart right. Because there's evil in this world. And surely we're not so self-centered that we're just going to sit by and watch it happen from now on out. Thinking that it won't ever come to our shores because it will. It will. Help us to be faithful to you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.